Exodus chapter 32 and verse number 6. See a word here I want to use tonight. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And that's not, what an interesting verse. So they just played. And the Lord told them, man, you all better get down to business. They were supposed to have been worshiping. They were playing. They were supposed to have been getting the children over yonder to the promised land. They were playing. So I will preach tonight on this subject. Playing church. Playing church. The main business of a church is to get sinners saved and preach the gospel. I remember when we was little, I never did do this much, but I had friends that did. Some of you guys did too. Uh, when I was real little, you know, five, six, seven years old, uh, we did not have video games like they got now to play, but uh, and, but we had, they had pinball games. You could go to the store or somewhere and had one, but didn't have video games. So all the boys, some of you older guys in here remember, that all little boys played uh, Army. Played Army. And you could go to the store and buy a whole bag, plastic bag, full of these little green army men about that big. How many of you ever played with those little green army men about that big? Okay? Little bitty dudes. And one of them, one of them would be like this, and he'd have a gun like this, you know? And you'd send him over there. And another one would be, you know, laying down on the ground like this with his rifle pointed. And another one, you know, he would uh, be in a fight like this. And another, and, and you'd take out there, you know, and I've seen them boys get out there. And they'd have little tanks. And you'd have these little tanks. He'd be out and he'd play and you'd make your little road. And little old bitty boys with a breeches leg wore out, you know. And uh, back when boys were boys, amen. And they'd push them in the dirt. And they'd, I mean, they'd be out there going, boom, 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 Knock that guy over, kill him. Knock that guy over and kill him. Shot him. Oh, he'd fall in the dirt. Man, they'd be into it. They'd be into it. Oh, boy. And it was great. And I remember some of them guys, they... They grew up, and I remember guys who were a few years older than me uh, who, who got drafted right before they quit drafting boys in the Army. And there's some boys in high school, old than I was, and they went and joined the Army. And they'd go out, and they would uh, they'd come back. I remember them coming back to Marion. And back then in Marion, uh, we had roses on Main Street. Everybody, if you want to see anybody, that was the biggest hangout. Everybody went to town on Saturday, sat in there at roses, and they'd have these little stools around here. You could sit there and drink a milkshake and, you know, see what was going on, the holler and cut up, act, act the fool. And everybody would, would sit there and talk and cut up and these boys. And they'd come into town uh, like this, and they'd done been the basic training. And they had their army pants on. I mean, their fatigues. They had that GI haircut, man. Just buzzed off of that real short. And boy, they had them boots. I mean, things was black as coal. And real shiny and everything. And here they'd come back. They thought they was something. Coming back into Marion, you know. Here I am. And all the girls go, Soldier boy. Oh, my little soldier boy. You know, I catch you know, they thought, oh, he's a soldier. And he, you know, he, he, he's, he's, he's uh, you know, whatever he was. G.I. Joe or Tom Cruise or somebody. And, uh, and, and they, they'd say, oh, and them boys say, yes, sir, I'm in the army. Look at me. I'm in the army. Get away from me, punk. Uh, get away. I am in the army. I am a soldier of the United States of America. And then boys, some of them old boys went to Vietnam. And boy, they got over there in Vietnam, and they trained them, you know, and they put them over there in Vietnam. And them guys got down in there, got down in that jungle. Now, I mean, it was 105 in the shade, and it wasn't no shade. And, 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 and it was, the humidity was just unbelievable. You just stand there and sweat come out on you. Jungle, you had to fight your way through there. I mean, they had mosquitoes. This, I, Lord have mercy. The mosquitoes, they say, in Vietnam, they'd come in and look at you at night. And one of them get in the tent and say, you want to eat him in here or take him outside? And they said, Lord, no, if we eat him in here, if we take him out, the big ones will get him. And, and so they'd eat him right there in the tent. And I mean, it was awful. And boy, I'm telling you, about that time, bullets started flying. Bombs started going off. I mean, it was out there and they'd seen their, their friends' arms and legs get blowed off. And they'd seen uh, blood and guts everywhere. Some of them didn't come back at night. They was out there starving to death, sweating. I mean, getting bit, laying in swamps of snakes and everything. And one said, hey, uh, where's Mama? You know, I'm ready to go home. This is, uh, they're shooting real bullets out here. I mean, man, get hurt. 
Uh, and then it wasn't so glamorous. Then it wasn't so, uh, you know, it wasn't like, look at me, I'm a soldier. It was a dog fight just to stay alive. And I thought about it and I thought, that's just the way church is. That's the same way. You know, we are the army of the Lord. Am I, is that right? Bible said, fight the good fight of faith. We are supposed to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. When you got saved, you got in God's army. And that's why some of them hymns in that songbook have a march beat to them. I guess, you know, that's why they do uh, You know, onward Christian soldier. I mean, listen, brother, you can't fight a war with this. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You can't fight. That ain't fighting music. I mean, you can't. Hallelujah, what's it to you? You know, I mean, that ain't, that, ain't, uh, that ain't soldiers in an army. That's Girl Scouts at a picnic. I'm telling you, brother, this is war. I mean, we need somebody to get on the trumpet and beat the drum and say, that's right. That's what we need. I mean, boy, we need something to make us charge the gates of hell. We need something that'll make us want to preach. Amen. We need something to make us want to say, stand for God. Be a soldier in the name of God. And you know what I found out? People do the same thing in church. People come in, big revival hits, people get saved, and boy, here'll be a bunch of young guys come in and get saved. Always happens. A bunch of young guys come in and get saved. I'm in the Lord's army. Got me a King James Bible. Got my hair cut back. Got me a towel. I'm in the Lord's army. But then the bullets start flying. Your wife leaves you. You lose your job. Doctor says you wind up with cancer. Your family lo- turns their back on you. Everybody gets drunk. And then you start saying, Good night. Uh, nobody told me it's going to be like this. This is war. Now, I'm going to tell you something tonight, ladies and gentlemen. I've been doing this since I was 18 years old. And you hear me and you hear me well tonight. It is a fight from day one. It's a fight every day of our lives. And we've got to learn how to fight. And if we're not, we're just, you know, there some little boys are doing this playing army. When they got in the real army, they quit. And you know what a lot of people are doing? Playing church. They just play in church. When the door hits, they're ready to quit and drop out. Some of you dropped out over the least little old thing. Some of you got, got, quit serving God because the least little old thing. You say, well, Brother Danny, I got in trouble and got prayed. Uh, well, big deal. Get over it and get your heart right with God and go and serve God anyway. You say, well, Brother Danny, I went through a divorce and I'm no longer worried. Oh, shut up. Quit crying. Hey, there's a lot of people been through a divorce. Uh, get on fire for God and, and take your licks and go on and do right and serve Serve God anyway. You say, well, my, my kids rebel. Well, I hate it, but serve God anyway. You say, my husband left me. I hate it, but serve God anyway. We're not supposed to play. This is war. What do you expect, brother? This ain't no picnic. We're on enemy territory. We're on the devil's turf. And may God help us tonight to fight battle and not just play around. I'm going to say a few things about it tonight. And I'm just going to name off some things and, and we got to have some meetings, okay? And so you listen tonight. First thing I'm going to say is a church, a church that does not magnify the Word of God is playing church. That Bible right there ought to be first in everything we say and do and believe. Everything we preach and believe ought to be based on the Word of God. I know churches tonight where you can go to them in Sunday school class and the Sunday school teacher never opens a Bible. They just open a book, tell a story or something. I'm not against uh, AIDS uh, 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 and, and helps and stuff, but brother, we need to teach them boys and girls. Every Sunday school teacher in here tonight, I want them boys and girls to see you with a Bible in your hand on Sunday. Sunday morning and open that book. They be taught that we magnify the Word of God. Bible said, Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Let me tell you something. This book right here has seen the birth of all the other all the books in the world. It'll see the grave of the rest of them. There ain't no book like that book right there. You read that thing every day of your life. Listen, listen, at Shining Light Baptist Church, you know what the fuck? 
part is, it's that book right there. It's not you. It's not your grandma. It's not a dream you had. It's not a vision I had. I had no vision. And when I ate too much pizza the other night, I'm going to tell you what, brother. Listen, I'm telling you, I had some bad dreams the other night. I mean, I don't know what I've done. Uh, but it was awful. I think it's when I ate a big greasy hamburger and french fries and tried to go to bed. Uh, but listen, that's not the final authority. The final authority is the Bible. The final authority is the Bible. The final authority is the Bible. You say, well, grandma Grandma had a dream. She said that. If Grandma's dream don't line up with the Bible, Grandma will tell her dream to go back to hell where it come from because God's Word is the final authority. Am I right? Yes, sir. Sure am. Now, I'm going to tell you something, brother. A church that does not magnify the Word of God is simply playing church. We have no right to exist. I had a little something here I was going to show you. And uh, uh, this little thing here, somebody said, somebody was comparing. They was comparing our cell phone to the Bible. You seen them little thing? And uh, they said, what if we treated our Bible like we do our cell phone? And it's talking about all the, uh, how people do their cell phone. And one of the points was that you, that you can't that uh, say, what, what if everybody in here that has stuck to your Bible as much as you are your cell phone? You can't go nowhere without that cell phone, but you can go all kinds of places without your Bible. You can't definitely go 30 minutes. Some of y'all can't set through a church service without checking it two or three times. And I'll see if somebody texts you or something like that. And yet you never open your Bible to see if God might be wanting to talk to you a little bit. I'm telling you, let me ask brother, this old book was here before there ever was a cell phone. And it'll be here when all of them's gone. And we ought to magnify the Word of God. That's why when you come to church, you turn them through things off and you are I seen girls last night going out the door like this and I was like well, I don't want to miss this call well fully on that call when God's word's being preached that and you listen to me there ain't nothing more important than what's book says while we're having preaching say amen he said brother Danny is it wrong to have a cell phone nope got one right there but brother if it buzzes I ain't answering it we're having church you say well if it's important it ain't as important as what you're hearing right now I, I, that's why the people. That's why I fuss at you when I see you standing around out here during Sunday school. You ain't got nothing that's important to talk about is what's being said right here in this pulpit. You say, well, well, I'm having a problem. Well, have it after church is over. Well, brother, we're having the Word of God preached in here. Amen, amen, amen. I'm telling you, a church that does not magnify the Word of God is simply playing church. I'm telling you, this Bible, brother, they ain't nothing like it. Amen. I heard somebody told me one time, they said... Uh, are you, are you Danny Castle? I said, yes, I am. I ran some people over here at Trailer Park yesterday out. And I said, hey, I'm Danny Castle. They said, you're Danny Castle? I said, yeah. And they said, well, we heard of you 20 years ago. And, and this and that. And we heard this and that. And I said, um, they said, are you really him? And I said, maybe. And I said, uh, why you yes. ask? And they, I said, maybe I am, maybe I ain't. And they see what you know first. And you know what? I, I said, uh, listen. Yeah, they said, well, Brother Danny. What about the Bible? I said the Bible is the most important thing in the world. There is nothing more important. So this lady said, she said, uh, Oh, you're Danny Castle. She said, I know so so, and I've worked with her. She says you are the best preacher she's ever heard in her life. And I almost started laughing. Because that person she's talking about comes about once a month. <laughs> there must not be too good a preacher if she shows up once a month to hear me. And uh, uh, she said, oh, she just brags on you. You know what that people problem like that is? They're just playing church. I, they're not sincere. Oh, I go to the best church and I got the best preacher and I got, I believe the King James Bible. But don't ever open it and don't ever read it. I'm telling you what, brother, listen. They're just, and they just like, boodin', boodin', pew, pew. He falls over, boodin'. No, no. Brother, this is real. We're in real battle. I want to say secondly tonight. Let me say this. Carnal-minded Christians. Carnal-minded Christians are simply playing church. Now the Bible said to be carnally minded is death. And so tonight, brother, we, we, we must not be carnally minded. Now what does carnal minded mean? Carnal means flesh. Fleshly minded. We have to be carnally minded uh, Christians. We're just fleshly minded Christians. In other words, all our, all our emphasis is just on, on us, us, we, we, my, my, us, me, I. That's what causes people to get divorced. You know what causes people to get divorced? Selfishness. 
I want what I want. I want what I want. I want to make me happy. I don't care about my kids. I don't know. I talked to the lady this week. She said, I'm tired of making everybody else happy. I'm tired of just, I've lived my whole life for other people. It's about time I live my life for myself. That's the most dangerous way in the world for you to think. Right there. There ain't nothing wrong with living to, uh, to take care of your kids. There ain't nothing wrong with living to take care of your wife or your husband. That's the way God intended. This is the most selfish generation uh, that we've ever seen, brother. Carnal minded. Everybody ready to sprout wings and fly away. But just as worldly as, 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 as you can imagine. Now, I'm going to tell you tonight, I'm not one of those legalistic preachers that says you have to dress a certain way on everything or to cut your hair a certain way or you ain't right with God. But I'm going to tell you something tonight. There ought to be a difference between a Christian and a sinner. There ought to be a difference than the way we act than the way they act. There ought to be a difference in the places we go and the places they go. If you go to the same places the sinners go to, what is the difference in us and except you just come church on Sunday? I'm telling you kind of minded Christians are just playing church. Say amen. Amen. I'm telling you tonight, brother, it's about time we follow the Spirit and not just the flesh all the time. Carnal minded Christians are just playing church. It looked like you just fell face first in a tackle box. And then, and then, and your hair, your hair is purple, and you got tramp stamps all over you, and all over here, and all over like that. And somebody's not going to say, "Well, they must be a great Christian." And I mean, sometimes you got your tramp, ain't nothing you can do about it unless you're rich. Uh, but listen, you can get right with God and cover it up, folks. Ain't that right? I'm telling you what, brother. You hear me? They ought to be a difference. They ought to be a difference in a Christian and a sinner. Say Amen. Like that. Now. Just in case you get self-righteous, that also goes for people that's got everything right, right, and ain't got a tattoo, and ain't got all that, but just full of their self and full of the devil too. That goes for all of us. You can be fleshly minded with a suit and a towel and a King James Bible under your arm. And that's the worst kind. Hey, Amen. I tell you what, boy, you know, I, some of the preachers just about gag me uh, to be around them. They are so holy and think they are so high and so mighty. I know some preachers I've known for 20 years, never heard them say they've done anything wrong, never heard them say they sinned, never heard them. Listen, a guy like that can make a dog throw up. I'm to gag a maggot off a gut wagon. That's what Billy Kelly and them used to say. I'll tell you something tonight, brother. You hear me? We're just playing church when we're carnally minded. Amen. You lose that temper at work and cuss everybody out. Hit a nerve over here in this section. So y'all can't control your temper. You know the old classic story is about 50 Newtons in here. The old classic story is a guy goes to the altar and he says, Dear God, please forgive me. I'm never going to get mad again. I'm going to lay my temper on the altar. God, please forgive me in Jesus' name. Amen. He gets up and he says, Lord, I'm never going to get mad again. On his way home. On the way home, he gets stuck in a traffic jam. Boy, that traffic is behind him. Some guy behind him goes, Beep! Boy, he gets mad. Oh, just fire. You know how you can imagine just, something just goes through you and it burns. You just, like, you know, and, he, and his fist went up like that and he turned around. And he said, No, no. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. This is a test. I just now asked God to forgive me. I'm not, Oh, Lord, 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 please help me, Lord, please help me, Lord, please help me, Lord. Okay. Okay. I'm all right. I'm not going to get mad. Okay. About two or three minutes later, that guy goes, Beep! Boy, he turns around and he throws his fist like that. And he said, No, no, help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. I'm not going to do it, Lord. Help me. He gets calmed down again. About two minutes later, that guy goes, Beep! Oh, Lord, he lost it. He slung the door open. He run back there. He hit that guy's window like that, that in the face. And he said, He goes, Buddy, I'm going to bust your face. That guy rolled it around. I just, I just saw your bumper sticker said, Honk if you love Jesus. You see, some people think, well, oh, I got me a bumper sticker. I'm holy. No, you ain't either. It takes more than a bumper. I think some people ought to take their bumper stickers off with a testimony God. Amen. I, I, sometimes I feel awful guilty, you know, when I pass everybody on the road and I got a bumper sticker. I said, Lord, don't let them see it. I'm in a hurry. Uh, you know, but I'm telling you something, brother. Listen, we're carnal minded Christians are just playing church. Amen. That's right. You know, we act like we love the Lord. You know. Yes, sir, boy. I just love the Lord, you know. Preacher, I don't claim to be much. Like that fellow, I heard about this fellow. He was out one day, and, they, and his, him and his buddy was playing golf. Faithfully, you know how some men are. Lord, they won't miss 
a golf game. I mean, when it's Monday, if it was snowing, the golf course is open, he'd be out there. I mean, he did never miss it. He had to play his golf game. He was out there one Monday playing golf like that. He was down hitting, you know, around some of them holes. And, he, and about that time, a funeral procession went by. And his funeral procession went by. That one guy stopped and he said, Hold it a minute. And he stopped and took his hat off like this and bowed his head. And then the funeral procession got by and his buddy said, Man, you know, he said, I didn't, I didn't realize he was that a religious man. I mean, you know, well, you showed respect to that funeral. Well, that made an impression on me. He said, Well, we was married 35 years. <laughs> that's, about, that's about right, ain't it? Ain't that about right? Y'all, some of y'all are slow. You, you're slow. You know, I talk fast. I talk real fast. I spit out a bunch of stuff, and I'd leave you four sentences somewhere. If I'm slowing down on purpose for you, come on, y'all. Let's go. I, I've got to go to Hannah's birthday party. I'm going to tell you something, brother. Carnal minded Christians are just playing church. But let me say something else tonight. Building worshipers. Building worshipers are playing church. Now, we don't have that problem here. No use spending much time. That's metal. That's insulation. Uh, that's a, one girl that was here last night from down in Gastonia. She said, this don't look like a church. I said, Shut up, you little brat. No, I, didn't, I didn't say that. Uh, she said, uh, why don't you have a steeple? I said, well, we're just wrist building. We're going to have one when we move over there. And she said, well, if I just drove by here, I wouldn't even know this was a church. I said, you see, it's still got a sign. we got a we got lies. You can't miss that. And, but you know what? People have this mentality that a church is a big building that goes real high. And got these weird looking windows you can't even see out. And, and, and they're all different colors. Why would you have a window you can't see out? And uh, they got weird looking stuff on them. They got pictures like this on the window. I'm telling you, I don't know why they put them demons on them pictures. I heard about this one. I heard about some guy. I forgot about this. I forgot about this. This guy said he was in one of them big Catholic churches somewhere and uh, he was walking through there and he hadn't been saved long and the cardinal was taking him through there and he said, there was Jesus. You know, they have Jesus like this on the cross. He's got the, like that or something, you know, and his arms look like a girl. Hair is red and his skin's white. And that's Jesus. Uh, uh, no way. And uh, his hair wasn't, wasn't red. And he had a dark skin. You know, they're trying to say Jesus is black. I don't care if he's purple. As long as he can save my soul, and his, his, his blood was for me. His color ain't got nothing to do with it. But that's how they make him look in them Catholic paintings. And it had Jesus here, and it had the Pope's here, and the Pope's there. And one of them said, he said, this right here is Louis the Fourteenth, Back over here. This is Pope John Paul the Ninth over here on the other side. He said, I heard of him. He said, that's Louis the Fourteenth. Never heard of him. He said, man, you mean you never heard of these great men? He said, no, I, I always heard the Lord was crucified between two thieves, but I never did know their name. <laughs> Amen. I like that. That's good preaching, ain't it? That's good preaching. And I'm going to tell you something this evening. Uh, for some of you that don't even know stuff like that, i tell you what to do. Just laugh when everybody else laughs. We don't know how dumb you are about stuff. Now, building worshipers. They think, some people think, oh, I'll just go to this church. because You know, when people move into town, you know what they do? They'll say, let's find us a church. Pick the biggest, nicest, churchiest building in town with a big steeple. And some of them buildings are skinny, but they're real high. I just wonder why they build them like that. I just turn them things over this way put a bunch of people in them. But, I mean, you can't put nobody in them. They're, they go straight up. They cloud up and rain in them things. And they, 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 they go way up like this. I remember, some of y'all remember, you might, uh, I don't know, how many of y'all went with us on that trip? The first trip, I took a bunch of other kids to New York. Y'all did. My girls did back there. We took our girls and uh, the, our youth choir up at New Manor. We took them and we all went to New York. We went by Washington, D.C. And uh, one of my buddies, Brother Alan Ryman from up there in Delaware, he said, we're going to take you out and show you one of the most elaborate Catholic churches in the world. And I'm telling you, brother, we went to this thing. Look, this, our church here, it wouldn't, even, it wouldn't even be the front steps hardly on that place. Where you walked up on the steps and it had gold, real gold. And little blocks up around all, all around the windows and and oh my goodness, you've never seen such a building in your life. And we went in there and here we went, a bunch of rednecks. I mean, here we went walking in there, people looking at stuff, you know, kids messing with stuff. I said, Now boys, don't mess with them kids is in there blowing out candles. 
Because them Catholics believe them candles are prayers for their dead loved ones. People that's died, they're in there blowing them out and messing with stuff. And when them nuns come over there and there's it, it cutting, life and saying, and they said, we well, bet you act like this in your church. I said, I bet you they do too. They do. But you know what their problem is? They think a building is a church. They think a building is a church, brother. That ain't, that ain't no church. The, the God don't dwell in a temple made with hands. I mean, brother, you can build a steeple in the reach of the moon. You can put stained glass windows 30 foot high. You can have carpets up thick. And God not in a million miles of it. Nothing wrong with all that. If you want to build us one like that, I'll take it. But people mistake that for a church and it's a church that's worshiping a building. Man, I've been in little old garages out there, brother, where there's, where there's posts sticking them up in little old wood benches sitting around the fire of God all over that place. And I've been in some big fancy churches where, like I said, that one church, I don't know if I remember that story right. All these stories popping in my head tonight. But there's, a, there's one church, uh, they said, uh, they come, one man said, um, oh, I left that church, something like this. And he said, I left that church. He said, why? He said, well, they put the piano on the, on the wrong side of the building. He said, well, what side of the building is it on? He said, I prayed about it and asked the Lord. He says, on that side. He said, it ain't on that side. It's the other side. He said, well, the Lord said He hadn't been there in so long. He didn't know what side it's on neither. That's about the way it is in a lot of churches. Amen? I'll tell you another story. This guy came in one time. There's a little old country church. And it was a little bitty country church. And, uh, and it was on Halloween. Like it's going to be here in a few weeks. And they was having a big Halloween party down, down the road. Well, this guy dressed up like the devil. And he was going to be the devil at the Halloween party. And he was going down the road. That, and that little old church was having a revival. The little church about as big as just one of our sections here. And then we'll be there. There's a shouting and a worshiping. And about that time, it come a big thunderstorm. I got a lightning flashing. And man, I'm telling you, you're getting this, aren't you? Girls, y'all listening? Man, they're glued. <laughs> and, listen, and listen, these are twins. Y'all two twins? What does that mean? Not identical. That's what that means, right? Uh, but anyway, uh, fraternal that means, I didn't know what that meant. But anyway, boom! Big lightning bolt hit. Boom! It thundered. And that guy got getting soaking wet with a devil suit on, and he, he said, oh, i got to get out of this rain. So he ran in the church. And son, about that time, that, that devil come running down the aisle. Them old people, they started going out the side doors, running out the back. And, and everybody run. I mean, they all took off. Running out the door, screaming, hollering, the devil! Grabbing their kids and running out the door. And one guy, they said he, he was trying to run out and he got his coat snagged on the pew like that. And he's hung like that. And he's trying to get out of No! And the devil come like, and the devil come down and he said, Wait a minute, devil. Wait a minute. I've been going to this church 20 years, but I've been on your side all along. <laughs> I thought, you know, that's what a lot of people do. If it come right down to it, that's what a lot of people do. I'm on your side, devil. Don't get me. I'm going to tell you something. They're just playing church. We went in that big old Catholic church that day. Good night. You wouldn't believe that place. Ooh, it was awful. It was spooky. You, I hate to say this, but you could feel demons. And Corey, my youngest daughter, started crying. She started crying. And I don't know how old she was. How old was she? Seven or eight? She started crying. Eighteen. <laughs> she got mad at you then, brother. She was eighteen when this happened. And no, she, she was about six or seven. She started crying. She said, honey, what's wrong? She said, I can feel the devil in that place. And these people go in there every Sunday and do... They go in there like this, and they sit down like this, and they got these. Every seat's got a little altar. You have been, you know, where you kneel down like this, and the, and they'll come around and you walk around. The priest will stick a old piece of cookie in your mouth, and you and you do all this kind of stuff. You know, you know how you heard about that priest that stuttered? He went like this. <laughs> That's awful. I'm feeling a little frisky tonight. <laughs> I'll, tell you I'll, I'll tell you something, brother. Hey, listen. That's a bunch of junk. That's the biggest bunch of junk I've ever seen in my life. Lord, just go watch a ball game. Go fishing. That ain't religion. That ain't serving God. That ain't a bunch of mess like that. Good night, people. I mean, you know, you know what? That's why kids don't want to grow up and be people like that. They can tell it's fake. 
They can tell it. When people are building worshipers, now we don't want to be building worshipers. I've heard, I know people that so scared being that they don't want a new church building. They're afraid God will leave. A lot of people like that can say, well, ever since we got here in the new building, I just don't feel Lord's presence no more. Because sometimes people build a big church and everything, and they think, well, we're a big shot and we're cultured. I've seen it happen. The church just die. Lord mercy, brother, I'd rather be over here and then in, on, on, in Carbon City uh, and have the Lord in here than to build a million dollar one over there somewhere and, and lose God's power and lose His trust. I ain't planning on doing it. I ain't going to let you get too fancy that the Lord won't bless you. I ain't going to let I ain't gonna let it happen. I mean that. I'm not going to let it happen. By the grace of God, by the grace of God, we're not going to be just building and worshipers, let me say hurriedly tonight, churches who do not pray are playing church. A praying church is, is a real church. Much prayer, much power. You can mark that down. You can mark it down. The more you pray, the more the power of God you'll have on your life. Preachers today are missing it. They think it's in our ability. They think, boy, you want to be a good speaker. Boy, you think, used to make me so mad, used to make me so mad. Morning. I'm gonna scream every night this week, and, and I'd sweat right now. See what that right there? I'm sweating more right now than some of you do on your job all day long working in a nice, cool place. I'm, I'm working right now, and it made me so mad. I prayed. I drove, nearly got killed in a car wreck, and fasted, and everything. And we had, they said that's the best revival we ever had. And then the preacher turned against me, and they said, "We don't love like him no more. We ain't have nothing to do with him no more." And they said that revival wasn't real. Oh, Danny, just Danny, he's just got that personality, and he's it's just just his personality that hurt my feelings. There ain't nobody got enough personality to change a person's heart. You might you might can entertain them a little bit with your personality. You might can make them laugh, make them cry, but you ain't gonna change nobody's heart. It takes God to do that. And brother, I prayed and I prayed. And I said, dear God, you do it. And God did do it. And he said, well, he's just got that charisma. And he's just got, boy, that makes me want to fuss when I hear that. I, and I'll tell you something, brother. It, it's not by my, it's not by power. It's not by personality. It's not by how good you can sing. It's not by how good you can preach. God has to come. And God comes when people pray. I was just thinking about our camp meeting. I'm going to talk about it. We want a great camp meeting. I'm going to tell you how we're going to have one. And I'm going to tell you why we don't. If we don't have one, it all depends on how hungry we are. Now we'll get down and pray. I'm hoping that some people in here tonight will get such a burden that you'll say, Brother Danny, I want the best camp ever had. I want God to speak to my heart. Do you want Him to? You know why churches have great meetings? That's what they want. You know why churches have dead services? Because that's what they want. He said, I'll pour water on him that's thirsty. God will give us what we want. And God will give us just exactly what we want. I hope tonight some of you preachers. How many preachers are we here tonight? Raise your hand if you're called to preach. I hope every one of you guys right here tonight, I hope God will put a hunger in your heart tonight. You'll say, dear God, and get a hold of the horns of the altar. Go up in the woods somewhere in the next few days uh, before the camp meeting and get a hold of God. And say, oh God, one more time, pour out the old time power. Down on our church. Let our teenagers get right. Let our wives get right. Let our boys get right. Let our mothers and daddies get right. And we'll pray. God will bless if we'll pray. The Bible said, This kind goeth forth not but by prayer and fasting. How long has it been since you fasted? You're not supposed to brag about it when you fast, but sometimes I'll get up and, I'll, and I'm going to do night when I get through. And we'll proclaim a fact. Because God will do things in result of people fasting that He don't do no other way. Fasting is something they did in the Old Testament. Fasting is something in the New Testament. Every real preacher down through the years has fasted and anybody who's never learned how to fast has never learned what it means to really get something from God. What is fasting? Fasting is not eating so that God's power will come down. It's denying your body what it wants to eat. I've heard people say, well, I can't fast. Oh, yeah, you can. You just won't. You say, well, I can't. I can't, preacher. I tried and I got hungry. Duh. You're not hungry. Of course you get hungry. Of course you get hungry. I Listen, when I fast, I fast every Wednesday, as you know. And then I do different. I have done it for uh, 16 years. And I hardly ever miss one. And I started in 1990, and and I do some other fasting as as I feel like the Lord leads me. I'm not I'm not bragging because I'm not a great great 
uh, fasting person. I'm not. I've not done it near as much as I should. But sometimes I'll get up and Wednesday is my day to fast. Like this week, Wednesday will be my day to fast. And I'm, I, I'll get up and I'll eat a bite all day Wednesday. Go drive and preach just like I'm preaching right now. And you think, my goodness, how do you jump and run around and scream and holler like that or if you ain't to eat? I don't know how you do, but it always seems like when I get started, I've got more energy that night than I had any other night. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Because that day, you kind of get cold and you get a headache. And, and you know, you just drink water and you think, Phew, and your flesh will start playing tricks on you. I usually don't eat nothing every day till 12.30 to 15.01. to 1. Every day. I won't tomorrow until about 15.01. to 1. I, Oh, yeah, i got to fix breakfast in the morning. forgot about that. Me and my girls are having breakfast, biscuits, and eating everything tomorrow about 10.30. But on a normal day, normal day, no, you can't come. And Six dollars a piece and you can. It's over on Lake James, the new house. Uh, but uh, uh, but I'm going to tell you something, brother. Normally, I don't eat till about 12.30. And I didn't get hungry till 12.30. Usually about 12.30, you know, and I done went running, I done read my Bible, I make tapes every, morning, every Monday morning, I get up and start making tapes. I'll start on the night when I get home. I make tapes all day on Monday. That's my job. Tuesday, I get caught up on my mail and mow the grass. Wednesday, I finally come to church. Thursday, I do whatever. And Friday, if we're going to preach or whatever, I do other things. And then Saturday, you know, we do bus route and stuff. That's usually a week. And then sometimes I preach every night. And you know what? On Tuesday and Thursday and Friday, I don't even get hungry at 1 o'clock. Don't even, I don't even need to think about nothing. On the day I fast, 10 o'clock that morning, I'm thinking, God, I'm starving. Oh, I want something to eat so bad. God, I don't have anything. Uh, now, what is that? You're not really hungry. It's your mind just telling you that you can't do it. You can't do it. You can't do it. You're going to die. You're abusing yourself. This is not right. God wants you to be healthy. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. Listen, brother, you'll be a lot healthier if you'll fast once in a while. Sometimes come in and they say, they say, preacher. Now come on, y'all, don't get quiet on me. You liked it a while ago. I'm trying to help you tonight. Some people say, well, brother Danny, I, I just can't do it. I get hungry. Well, of course you get hungry. And it's just like lifting weights. You know, I'm doing push-ups. And I do push-ups during the day. And I kiss on my dresser. And I do them, about a hundred of them every morning. Whoa. And, uh, and boy, I tell you what, boy, I, I, I do, it's just what you get used to. And the more you get used to, the more you can do it. So what you want to do is you want to fight. And every time your stomach says, I'm starving. So shut up. Lord, bless the camp meeting. Lord, bless the camp meeting. Bless the camp. And then that little pain, it'll go away. And then it'll come back in a little while and say, I'm really starving. You've got to feed me. And you say, Shut up. You ain't getting nothing. And your belly will say, Yes. Yes. I'll kill you. We're, we're, you'll die right in a day. And you'll say, No, that's, that's what's wrong with most Americans. We're eating ourselves to death. Let me ask you this. How many of you have ever went out on a Friday night? You're going out to eat with your sweetie or whatever. And you say, Honey, what would you like to eat? I don't know. Want to go to steakhouse? No. Want to go Mexican? No. Not in the mood for it. How about seafood? Shoe? No. I'm not. What about Chinese? No. Well, where do you want to go? Y'all ride past the same restaurants three or four times. Riding all over Hickory. Where do you? I don't know. Where do you want to go? I don't know. Where do you want to go? I don't know. And you first say, I'm, I just don't know what I'm in the mood for. And you ride around, ride around. And you look, you look, you look, you look, you look. Finally, you just go somewhere and say, this wasn't no good. And pay for it, pay for it as, as, as you leave. Now, let me tell you what your problem is. You ain't hungry. You ain't hungry. That's what your problem is. You're not hungry. You say, well, I just don't know what I'm in the mood for. You ain't hungry. You ain't even digested the last three meals you eat, man. <laughs> I'll tell you, you don't believe I'm telling the truth? This is Sunday. Right now, Sunday evening at 7.30. Don't need a bite. Don't need a bite from now to Tuesday morning. Don't need a bite. Boy, you say one more word and I'm going to hit you with a song book. <laughs> and when, you, when you don't need a bite from now to Tuesday morning, and it won't take you 30 seconds to make up your mind what you want. It won't. It won't take you 30 seconds. You won't have to say, I don't know what I'm in the mood for. 
will you? Son, a bologna sandwich sounds just fine. Cold biscuit and mater will be just fine. You don't eat nothing from now to Tuesday morning. You ain't going to be hard, please. You know what's wrong with us in this country? We're eating ourselves to death. And God says prayer and fasting. I'm going to proclaim a fast tonight. I had a bunch more I was going to say tonight, but I'm going to hush right there. And we're going to proclaim a fast. going to do a little bit different this year. We're going to do a little bit different this year. We have a 40-day fast for the youth rally usually. This time, well, for the camp meeting, we're going to have a seven-day fast. We're not going to play church here in the next few days. We mean business. Now, when you fast, I've had people ask me, do you drink juice? Some people drink juice. Some people, I, me personally, I just drink water. That's all, water. And uh, you say, well, I have to take my medicine. It says you have to take it with food. Take it with water. It will not kill you. Hang on, I've done lots of times. Uh, you drink enough water with it, it'll dilute it and wash it down down. Uh, take it and say, I'm not going to eat. Now, in the Bible, the most common fast is one day. It'd be like if you fasted tonight till tomorrow night, this time, 24 hours. You might want to do it that way. Or you might want to eat tonight and then not eat all day tomorrow and tomorrow night and eat Tuesday morning. That's the way uh, some people do it. What I'm going to do tonight... I'm going to break the days of the week down. We're going to do a seven-day fast starting tomorrow morning. 